my name is Tim Northover, and I'm here from ARM to talk about our new 64-bit architecture, ARCH64, which I've been working on an LLVM backend for. OK. I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit about the architecture, just introducing some of its features. Uh, then I'll talk about our goals for the LLVM backend and what we were aiming for and sort of roughly its current status. Then I'll talk about some of the tests we uh, have run on it, sort of, and been running all the time. And then the next section's a bit eclectic. It's a few sort of interesting differences from the normal, uh, either, well, the first two are LLVM style, and the third one's just a weird little set of instructions that the uh, architecture has that took me quite a while to work out what it's supposed to do. Um, and after that, I'll talk about, I suppose, the stages we went through creating the back end, and then some things that are going to have to be implemented and change in future. So what is this ARCH64? It's our new 64-bit architecture. It's a risk-like, so every instruction's 32 bits, uh, acting on a fair bunch of registers and load store architecture. There are 31 general purpose integer registers that are 64 bits wide, labeled X0 to 30. Uh, and they've got aliasing sub-registers with W prefixes. And then you've got the usual bunch of um, extra registers that some instructions address either implicitly or explicitly, the program counter, stack pointer, and the zero register, a bit like dev slash zero. Uh, it's always got a floating point support, which is a good change which has 32 registers, each 128 bits wide, uh, with usual just sub-registers acting um, for smaller widths. It doesn't have ARM's uh, idiosyncratic aliasing, where two sort of floating 32-bit floating point registers uh, join together to form the 64-bit register. So the allocator's rather simpler, or got an easier job of it. And the goal, I think, was to design an architecture that's about as nice as a compiler could hope for. So we hopefully don't have to make LLVM sufficiently smart to get good code out in the end. And this is just a tiny example of uh, what it might look like. This function, as you can see, just calls out to another and does a small bit of 32-bit arithmetic. Uh, it could compile to something like this. Uh, where the first two lines are prolog code setting up your stack and storing the callie saved and return register. You save your argument, call out to bar, do the arithmetic, and then load everything back and return. And you should see that it looks pretty much like 32-bit uh, ARM code. Uh, in fact, if you put it side by side, the only differences are different register numbers, x's become r's, as do w's in this case, and the final return structure's slightly different, but it should, well, and the stores, but they should, it's very familiar for people who have done ARM. So now I'll talk about uh, what our goals were in creating the back end and uh, how far we've come. We started out back in January, and we wanted an LLVM backend targeting ELF output on Linux. And the significance of that is that ELF would be the primary format. We'd enable the integrated assembler all the time. And the assembly output was designed just to be a guide for someone debugging, really. Uh, if it happened to be acceptable to GNU assembler, that would be nice. But we didn't even particularly care about that. Uh, we wanted to use up-to-date LLVM APIs and style. Uh, there's no cogen-only instructions in there. We didn't want to have de things deprecated out from under us while developing or soon after. We wanted it to be a strongly tested backend that people could have confidence in using. And perhaps most importantly, we wanted it to be able to compile all of the, hopefully, any standard compliance C and C++. These are the 98 and 99 standards. We, at this stage, weren't particularly interested in optimization because that's far more easy, or far easier when you've got actual chips on hand to test things, which we don't yet. And we weren't that interested in things that C and C++ didn't use. Uh, the MC JIT's just not been looked at. There's no fast iCell because it wasn't necessary to get correct code. And uh, inline assembly, well, that's not standards compliant. 
Um, so how did we do? Well, I think it's OK at the moment, really. We've, I think the C and C++ are well supported. We've run spec 2000 and spec 2006. These contain sort of reasonably substantial bodies of code, uh, GCC and Perl in particular, but also other strange things. Uh, everything passed except the ones that used Fortran for obvious reasons. And Clang's built itself and then run the regression tests on a model. That took 12 hours. They all passed, essentially. Um, but we haven't taken the next step of uh, building Clang using the Clang built Clang, because obviously if 12 hours just to run the regression test, we'd be there till January. Uh, the work on the advanced, the SIMD instruction set that's included, uh, called NEON, is ongoing. We're coming up to a fifth of the way through that being implemented, but it's probably not ready to use in certainly any kind of production setting yet. Uh, the LLVM test suite we just ran a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is slightly out of date. Um, I actually believe now it has only one potential failure. The rest were things that have sort of drifted and were legitimately different in the benchmark code normally. And a test called MC Hammer that I'll talk about a bit more in a bit in a minute uh, passes and on the complete set of scalar instructions for this architecture. Now this slide was meant to be great. Um, it was, everything was supposed to be available and ready to use, but unfortunately, lawyers got involved. Um, <laughs> so the newest information is that sort of in a few weeks, we will really be able to send patches to the list with this architecture, and people can actually start trying it. In the meantime, the rest of the information on here is valid, and there are models available, freely available by Lenaro and ARM, and file systems and other tool chains, so you can fiddle around and get things working and play. And when it does get upstreamed or sent to the list, I'd like you to run any program you're interested in and send the results back. Breakage is good. So I'm going to talk more about uh, how we tested the back end now. Um, the lower level bits, the MC layer was particularly easy and used this MC Hammer thing that was introduced at the European Dev meeting back in April. Uh, it was implemented by Richard Barton from ARM who gave the presentation. And the idea is that you iterate through all 32-bit uh, bit patterns, all 4 billion of them, disassemble them, reassemble them, send them every which way through MC and make sure everything is consistent with an independent implementation. After you've done this, you can be reasonably sure that uh, most parts of the MC layer are correct, the disassembler and so on in particular. Uh, but as I say at the bottom, the uh, slight caveat is that it doesn't check um, off by one assembly operands or weird things like that that uh, still need carefully thought out regression tests to make sure that we've got it right and it doesn't break in future. Uh, and this has been executed on all builds of uh, the AIOPS 64 backend uh, all the way through. And it's sort of the problems it did pick up during development, and it did, uh, have directed me towards implementing the correct set or a more useful set of regression tests. And, well, but it's still not complete. So now I'll go on to a few of the harder bits for testing. Uh, relocations were a particular problem. Um, they go through so many layers uh, in LLVM. You start off with this MO low 12 attached to DAGs and machine instras. Then as it goes through to the MC inst, it becomes this uh, variant kind low 12, uh, which then becomes a fix up when it's emitted. And finally, a relocation with an attached number uh, when it's um, emitted to uh, stream to ELF, I think. Uh, so if there was just a typo between very similar relocations in any of these, you could see you'd get the wrong relocation out. And well, I think everything's working. We can compile uh, substantial real code, but you can never be quite sure. Um, so the only thing we've had to do here, can do here is uh, careful regression tests, which 
run both LLVM object dump to check the names and elf dump to check the codes. Uh, Uh, code gen is another difficult bit. I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. You can never be quite sure that uh, your patterns and custom ICEL DAG to DAG code does correct, uh, select exactly the right immediates and no more and no less and encodes them correctly. And the only solution we've got here is uh, more handwritten tests. And a couple of extra ones. Um, Exceptions were reasonably difficult. I mean, in principle, you, for LLVM, it's got great support. You just have to tell it that you want dwarf-style exceptions, and in your frame code, emit the correct frame, uh, dwarf frame information. But in practice, what you get out of that is just a uh, .eh frame section that may or is a bunch of bits and may or may not be correct. How there are relocations to get right. I mean. One thing that particularly bit us was that uh, I'd cribbed the code from the x86 uh, relocations to use, and it was slightly different. The small model mel memory model on x86 says that code and data are in the bottom four gigs of memory, but ours, because of the uh, instructions that are used, says it's four gigs somewhere in memory, so you need the full eight-byte relocations to be able to address that properly. And the only, this came up when a large-ish program failed at link time. And more along the same lines, debugging information. Uh, it's another case of just um, squinting at it and writing the tests and hoping that the next person to come along that touches it um, looks at the tests again and agrees. <coughs> So now I'm going to talk about the oddities in the back end and uh, architecture. Uh, I'll start with this uh, slightly different implementation of load store patterns in ARCH64. The usual back end you see um, when it has an address with sort of complex uh, addressing modes, say in this case it would be a register base and an immediate offset, uh, the assembly just says it's a single thing and delegates it to this MI operand info, which uh, makes everything custom. It'll, the MI operand info means that it'll have two operands on the machine inst and MC inst. But this has the disadvantage that it needs a custom ASM parser to take the complex expression someone's written and put it into these two MC insts. Inst printer to take it back. Uh, disassembler, which to take it from the bits and create these two operands and an encoder. And the C++ selection code tends to end up fairly complicated and duplica uh, duplicated. For example, this instruction here, which would look for a 64-bit uh, base added to the sign extension of a 32-bit uh, register shifted left by three, you can already see you're going to be digging sort of three nodes deep into your DAG to be able to match that successfully. So about halfway through the ARCH64 development, I decided I wasn't having any of this and went to the sort of natural implementation that other instructions have where you specify where all the operands are explicit and specified in the assembly. Uh, as a result, all of the MC cons bits became much simpler. Uh, the four components just had to shuffle bits around as they do for every other instruction and the table gens designed to automate. The disadvantage is the patterns, those three question marks there, what do you write when you want to code gen this instruction, did not become simpler, although they moved to table gen. On the sort of implementation I ended up with had a multi-class hierarchy, which seems sane, but on the one hand, you might want to uh, match both an operand with or without the shift uh, on the incoming DAG, which sort of suggests that you need to have or want, would prefer to have the DAG, uh, the, this, dis, this fact decided towards the top of the multi-class hierarchy. But on the other, you've got various instructions acting on bytes, words, signed, and so on, which would be easier to set at the top as well and these can't be easily uh, reconciled. Uh, in the end, it did work. Uh, the, end, 
the table gen was fairly ugly. Um, it used the weird for each and subst operators sort of styled after what make does. And I think this could be improved, though, if you added um, general DAG appending operators to uh, table gen, much like the pat frags do for the instruction selection, then I think a lot of the complexity added to table gen could be simplified. And the C++ obviously disappeared a lot. The initial patch ended up, as I say, say there, sort of a net win. But of course, it's still a little undecided whether it's worthwhile in total because it's made the ARCH64 backend different to other ones and slightly harder to maintain because of it. And the table gen is currently fairly opaque. Uh, another useful trick I've used during it is there are often a lot of instructions that have very similar operands. Uh, for example, an unsigned immediate with five bits, 12 bits, or whatever. And at the moment, when you define your operand classes to handle this, you've got to um, create C special C++ stubs to handle each of them specially. So what I've managed, or at least up until a few weeks ago, was to use C++ templates in the predicate in the methods you specify. And <coughs> I think this is quite a nice trick for uh, reducing the amount of uh, duplicated code you have to write in the C++ files. Uh, but it does require table gen to sort of be aware of this. A couple of weeks ago, um, it started using the string in there as an enum tag with obviously bad results. Um, so I think, but I think that could be fixed and made to uh, be official. Now, this final one is um, a very odd but nice instruction that ARCH64 has. It's not implemented in instruction selection yet. Uh, but when I first saw it, I had absolutely no idea how, you, how or why you'd possibly use it. And it's called conditional compare. And what it does is this particular instruction here relies on a previous compare and checks whether the flags actually said greater than or equal to. That's the GE at the end. If it did, then it does the new comparison and sets the flag register appropriately. If it didn't, it sets NZCV to this random immediate of 12, N equals 1, Z equals 1, so uh, 0, and so on. And I had no idea what it did. But it's actually a fairly natural extension of something that you can do on an ARM with its uh, more general predication. So if you've got a conditional like this one, checking that uh, two things are both greater than or equal to two others, then you could implement it like this. First you do just compare the first two. If that was successful, you perform this second comparison. Otherwise, it's a no-op. And it turns out that if they're both greater than or equal to, the flags will say greater than or equal to, and you go to the good place, everything's fine. And if either of them fails, then the flags won't say greater than or equal to, and it's also implemented correctly. And there are various generalizations of this. You can see that you could obviously just add more and more and greater than or equal to comparisons with more CMPGE operators in there. You can actually uh, do an or operation against less than instead of an and with greater than or equal to by uh, flipping things around. And there are certain very odd corner cases with compar compatible comparisons that set the NZCV flags in just the right way that they work together even though they're not the same that you can do. But it doesn't cover everything. And for example, this one with a greater than or equal to comparison and then a equality. You might try to follow the pattern, uh, but then there's nothing you can put in the conditional jump that captures uh, the semantics in both cases where neither comparison passes or one does or both do. But with this conditional compare, you can. You start off doing your first comparison, and then if that succeeds, gives you greater than or equal to, you do your second comparison and branch off somewhere good if those second two were equal. But what if that first comparison fails? Then the flags will currently be saying something like less than, but you want them to say not equal. And that's exactly what 
this immediate can give you. There are lots of things that could flag as not equal. It happens that the constant immediate zero gives you it. So that's what the conditional compare does. It was very neat. So now I'm going to talk about um, what went into creating the back end, sort of how long it's taken us and um, what we've done there. So the first about one and a half months was just me working on the basic layout, uh, trying to get it so that more people could join in if they wanted to. Then after that, there were sort of four months of uh, implementing all of the scalar instructions systematically. Um, we've got this sort of spreadsheet of them and just went through the lot. Um, and then since then, since, I don't know, July, June, we've been working on integrating it with uh, real C++ code. Uh, this time, I think you could have gone shorter if you were uh, willing to give up MC layer support in the initial uh, release. But I suspect doing that would actually um, lead to quite a lot of refactoring and annoyances later on when you did add MC layer. I often found that um, an idea that worked really well for CodeGen had to be adapted quite significantly to work well for the MC layer afterwards. So in the first sort of phase, I started off just trying to compile this trivial program, uh, return void. And even that was surprisingly difficult because uh, you have to get your flags right on the registers so that this return instruction you implement isn't eliminated as dead code. And <coughs> it turned out sort of six months down the line that um, I'd even got that wrong. And uh, a larger program decided to clobber my return register later on as well. So it's surprisingly difficult. Um, and then after that, I decided that since we were wanted to test things as thoroughly as possible, the next step was to get some way of getting live values in and out of LLVM without it eliminating them as uh, being irrelevant via optimizations. So I went for global variables there, but you could equally do um, function parameters if you were willing to uh, step in and implement an ABI um, that early on. And finally, I got uh, basic relocations working, ELF and all the bits coming up together so that uh, two people wouldn't be uh, stepping on each other's toes too badly when they implemented different instructions. So then during the phase where I was implementing the scalar instructions, um, it was basically a case of um, making sure the MC layer was perfect via this MC hammer uh, test I mentioned earlier, and then fixing any bugs there and writing the appropriate tests. And then for the easier instructions, I put patterns in. But for everything else, I just made a note later. We won't worry about this now. Um, we'll uh, do it later. Uh, and then when I got bored witless with that, I implemented some interesting bits. I got tail calls done there as well. I did implement the ABI and prologue and epilogue emission. And the second phase, uh, the third phase was when that was done, we started trying to make it work with real, real code, which uh, turned out rather well. The approach uh, we took early on meant that Hello World just compiled and ran straight away on the model under Linux. Uh, Zlib needed a couple of patches uh, to select some odd things it didn't, uh, that weren't covered by the um, ad hoc thing before. Uh, but it failed in odd corners. Uh, for example, well, atomics were completely missing, and the uh, different variants of select CC just, they were, they don't correspond to a single instruction, but to um, complex uh, sequences of them. So they haven't been covered by looking at a set of instructions and then trying to um, implement obvious patterns from them. And uh, this phase also covered um, the larger features, the dwarf, exception handling, thread local storage, um, and so on. So currently, the back end's in a good state but there is still more work that needs to be done on it, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, 
The first obvious thing is unimplemented features, things that just aren't there at all. Uh, we've not even looked at the JIT, the MC JIT. As I said before, there's no fast I cell. We only implement uh, the small memory model that I mentioned where code and data are within four gigabytes somewhere. There's also tiny and uh, large for when you want to address absolutely massive objects. Uh, Neon support, as I said before, it, it's going on, but it's not finished. Um, and we don't uh, necessarily expect uh, Clang's-S output to be acceptable to GNU assembly yet. And inline assembly is just, we've done nothing. But there are also, I think, quite a few refact uh, bits of refactoring that we'll need to do as well. At the current, uh, ARCH64 uses literal pools in the middle of code like ARM. And so to handle this, we've had to port across the constant islands pass that ARM uses to make sure they're in range of the instructions that they actually use them. And this is basically just duplicated code at the moment. The bulk's identical to what ARM does with sort of slight accommodations for the different instruction lengths and widths and de uh, destinations of uh, ARCH64. Um, but it really should be generic code shared by both ARM and ARCH64. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is that constant islands on ARM doesn't just do this literal pool uh, placement. It also um, tries to narrow thumb instructions and does that between each attempted iteration. So they're all intermixed with things that ARCH64 doesn't care about at the moment. So some work will need on that, be needed on that. And it's also virtually impossible to test. I mean, uh, I tried to write a test for it directly, and uh, you need sort of some a megabytes worth of instructions to make it work, which uh, takes a very, very long time to compile and would just not be acceptable in the regression tests. Uh, there's also long double on ARCH64 is a 128-bit float, which is almost completely illegal. There's no hardware operations to support it at the moment, but it has to be passed in the floating point registers uh, at parameter calls. So it's not acceptable for it to be an illegal type as far as LLVM is concerned. Otherwise, the type legalizer goes in there and messes up your ABI completely. So because of this, um, there's been some duplication from the legalized types phase which isn't directly accessible from target lowering to handle uh, lowering of virtually every 128-bit floating operation. And finally, I think, uh, there's infrastructure. We'd like, uh, as soon as we can release it, ARCH64 to become quickly a fully supported target. Um, um, yeah, not experimental anymore. So to do that, we obviously need some infrastructure and testing to go on so that it, people can have confidence that it's not going to regress. So what can we do to help there? Can we, uh, well, there'll only be simulators until for probably a year or so. Uh, we'd like to do build bots, but uh, what can they run? Uh, what should they do? Would daily tests be acceptable? Uh, probably not for everything, but um, they could certainly help. And the LLVM test suite, it took about 29 hours when I run it, but uh, could still form a part of use. Uh, okay, so that's it.